So my name is Kristen Fletcher. I'm the Programs and Community Engagement Coordinator here at the Haley Public Library. Tonight, the third talk in the Our Water series takes an historical look at battles over local water claims for domestic, agricultural, and industrial uses. Our presenter tonight is John Lundeen. John is a lawyer, historian, and author who splits his time between Seattle and Ketchum. He has written and lectured extensively about the Wood River Valley history, inspired by his great grandparents, Matthew and Isabel Campbell McFall, who moved to Bellevue, Idaho in 1881 and built the McFall Hotel in Shoshone in 1900. He wrote Sun Valley, Ketchum and the Wood River Valley, an Images of America book for Historia Arcadia Press, a couple of his previous books include Skiing Sun Valley, a history from Union Pacific to the Holdings by History Press, which uh, recently won two prestigious National Book Awards, including a SCADE Award from the International Ski History Association as an Outstanding Ski History Book. Another book, Early Skiing on Snoqualmie Pass, was named Outstanding Regional History Book by the International Ski History Association. His long-term project is a book about the history of the Wood River Valley based on experiences of his relatives. He has um, had many interviews with Karen Bosick with Ion Sun Valley. So if you go to their website and look for their video archives, you'll see several of those. And uh, just next, uh, this upcoming week, he's going to be interviewed by Idaho Public TV for an upcoming show about the railroads of Idaho, which will air next spring. So please join me in welcoming John Lundeen. And just a reminder, John, you'll need to unmute yourself. I think I'm unmuted, aren't I? You are, yes. And Great. Kristen, um, I'm still getting two pictures of Kyle and, and Paul on the right-hand side of my computer. Is there any way you can make those go away? Because they will interfere with some of my slides. Or maybe um, you can delete all the pictures while I talk. I don't believe I have any more capacity to do that than I have already. Because for me, I just see you on the, the screen to the right of the screen. Okay, well, I see three of you, but I will uh, <laughs> go ahead, although it will interfere a little bit with uh, coverage of the, uh, some of the material on the slides. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight uh, by Zoom. Hopefully, as Kristen said, we'll be able to get back to live series very soon. I was fortunate last week to be at the community library and hear Tim Egan uh, give the first live talk that was given for a year and a half. and. It was marvelous and we all hope to get back there soon. As uh, Kristen said, this is the um, third in a series of water talks this summer. And uh, if you haven't seen the prior two, I strongly recommend you do so. The first one was by Jim Bartolino, who's a geologist. And he talked about the geology and hydrology of the uh, Bigwood River Aquifer and was fascinating. Uh, the next one was by Kevin Lakey, who is the water master for District 37, our district. And he talked about how he regulates uh, the flow of the surface water from the sources via the canals into the land irrigated. And again, both uh, were terrific and very educational. I'm taking a totally different tack. First of all, I'm going to talk about some of the recent uh, hot issues and updates in uh, water law and water issues in the valley. And I'm going to take an historic look going back to see how uh, from the earliest uh, settlement of the Wood River Valley, water was a dominating issue and conflict started very shortly uh, after the first settlement and had, uh, most of the conflicts had to be resolved by litigation. I will say that this is an update of a talk I gave at the community library in 2017 that was part of a, a um, Smithsonian traveling exhibit on water issues in the West. And a lot of this material was prepared for the large screen in the auditorium of the community library. 
And so some of these particular maps won't show as clearly as it did in the big screen. But uh, if you really want to um, see them in detail, you can go back later and stop the presentation and take a look at them and examine them in, uh, in detail. So as anyone who's heard me uh, speak before, uh, this is the reason that the Seattle lawyer is uh, talking to you about Wood River Valley history. As Christian said, my great grandparents, Matt and Isabel McFall, moved to Bellevue in 1881 and were early pioneers. They built the uh, International Hotel, which this is it, in 1881 in Bellevue at the corner of Main and Oak. And um, this is a picture of my great grandparents and three of their children. My grandmother was built and was born in 1890s, so she doesn't appear in this picture. When the International Silver Depression that started in 1888 shut down mining in the valley, they moved to Shoshone, which was still booming as a railroad center, and built the McFall Hotel uh, as a railroad hotel, which is still standing there. And that's my grandmother right there in uh, the early 1900s. Uh, Matt was a businessman and uh, had a number of other investments in the area. Uh, this is the Campbell family, my great grandmother's brother and his family. They also moved at the same time. Neil Campbell had the first blacksmith shop in, in uh, Bellevue, which is shown here. Um, he ran a stage operation from Bellevue to Muldoon. Um, he and his sons owned 41 silver mines over the years in the area and a number of ranches. Um, and this is Neil and his family and two of his four boys, uh, Stuart and George. Uh, Stuart was the elected uh, inspector of mines from 1920 to 32, a very important post in those days. And George was Blaine County Sheriff in the 20s and 30s. So what we're talking about generally is the, the Big Wood River Valley and how it uh, fits into the overall complex of aquifers and rivers nearby. And this is Water District 37. Uh, Kevin Lakey, who talked last time, is the water master for uh, District 37. And it's actually known as the Malad River system. Um, it comprises the Bigwood River here, excuse me, uh, the, the Little Wood, there's Magic Reservoir, and Shoshone is down here. And the Big and Little Wood Rivers come together beyond, just beyond Gooding, into the 12 mile long Malad uh, River, which goes into the Snake. So because that's the last tributary into the Snake, the whole system is known as the Malad River uh, system. Um, as many of you know, because the whole, this whole part of Idaho and, and the United States was underwater many millions of years ago, uh, the whole valley and the surrounding areas is basically limestone, which is very porous. And as a result, you've got a lot of water going from the surface into the underground aquifers, uh, including the Bigwood River over in uh, um, two valleys over. Uh, and you can see this picture. It, it actually comes out in what's called the Thousand Springs in the Snake River, which is just a gorgeous tourist site. Let me talk about uh, the hot new news of uh, the last week and a half. Uh, water issues have dominated the Wood River Valley ever since the beginning of the settlement. Uh, the valley's first water right was claimed in 1880 and the first lawsuit over uh, water rights claims was filed in 1883 and resolved in 1884. So people have been battling about water because it was so important to, to life ever since. There have been, in the last few years, there have been two calls, water calls from the downstream users around Shoshone to the uh, water users in the Wood River Valley because the downstream users have prior and older water rights and they're not getting enough water. So they have the legal right to stop the use of water upstream. Um, in 2015, their call was dismissed on legal technicalities this year, it actually resulted in litigation uh, in June. And on June 30th, there was a uh, 
leading decision where uh, 140 irrigators in the Bellevue Triangle, which is about 23,000 acres, were ordered to stop pumping groundwater from wells for any consumptive use, including agriculture, commercial, industrial, municipal uses. Water for livestock and home use was not affected. And this is a very innovative order because historically surface water, uh, the rivers and streams and groundwaters from the aquifer have never been, been managed together as one source, which is known as con conjunctive management. So this is a first far reaching decision to try to integrate uh, regulation and control of those two water sources. However, yesterday I had to update the presentation because uh, this appeared in uh, the uh, Mountain Express. I don't know how many of you read, uh, read it, but because of the dramatic impact of that order issued on June 30th, the upstream and downstream users got together and negotiated a settlement. And it was described as a historic water rights settlement that was approved by the Idaho Department of uh, Water Resources. And it settled the issue that uh, was uh, imposed by the, the uh, court. And uh, basically, here's what happened. The Bellevue Triangle farmers can continue irrigating uh, using water from their wells, but they have to maintain a certain flow in the Little Wood River down by Richfield. They have to set uh, send um, a certain amount of water to downstream farmers and compensate them for crop losses and other losses they suffered this, uh, suffered this summer because of the interference of their use of their particular water. Uh, the Bellevue Triangle farmers must also acquire and deliver water from the Snake River or American Falls Reservoir and deliver it to the downstream users around Shoshone via the Milner Gooding Canal. Um, and then there, uh, part of the agreement is that um, the northern and southern water users must develop a comprehensive groundwater management plan for the Bigwood River Basin and submit it to the Idaho Department of Water Resources by the end of the year. And the hope is that the entire basin will reach conjunctive management which is the uh, technical term, where groundwater, river water, and spring-fed water is managed as one collective resource. And our governor said the settlement sets the stage for a long-term solution in the Wood River uh, area. So this really is a dramatic turnaround. That conjunctive management has never been reached for, and maybe we'll get there because as Jim Bartolino pointed out to us a couple of weeks ago, it's one water system. Some of it is on the surface and some is underground, but it's the same amount of water and it's never been managed together. And perhaps for the first time it will be from this point on. Just a couple quick comments about the history of the Wood River Valley to bring us to a common understanding of where we are. In 1879, Galena ore was discovered in the Wood River Valley and Galena is an amalgam of silver, lead, and zinc. And that started a huge silver rush in the spring of 1880, where thousands of uh, hopefuls came, poured into the valley and um, settled here. And Carrie Adele Strayhorn, who you hear about later, said that the hunger for gold or silver is a disease more contagious than measles. And once in the blood, it is seldom, if ever, eradicated. And claims were staked, mines were opened, and towns formed. And this became really the largest silver producing area in the 1880s of the country. But the Wood River Valley was isolated and people had to travel from rail stops by wagon or stagecoach uh, into the valley and goods had to come uh, in and go out the same way. And from Haley, it was, a uh, uh, 135 miles to a rail stop at Blackfoot or 170 miles down to Kelton, Utah, which is on the Maine West uh, Union Pacific line. So one of the important things for the future was getting railroad access here. Uh, some people that helped achieve that goal were Robert Strayhorn and his wife, Carrie Adele Strayhorn. 
Robert was a publicist for the Union Pacific Railroad. He was hired to tour uh, Idaho in the Northwest uh, to write articles about its economic potential because Union Pacific um, for a long time and wanted to build its Northwest connection to uh, Portland and access the, the Northwest trade. Um, his wife, Carrie Adele, wrote articles for women uh, in women's magazines that told them how terrific their life could be. And uh, her book was, or her articles were uh, put together in a wonderful book called 15,000 Miles by Stage, published in 1912. Still one of the best descriptions of life in the West uh, in those days. And in 1881, Union Pacific decided to build its Northwest connection from its main line uh, in Granger, Wyoming, through Idaho to Portland, using a subsidiary called the Oregon Short Line. And the new line was built that whole distance in November 1884. But coming west, um, Strayhorn convinced Union Pacific that they should stop going west and build the Wood River Branch to access the silver mining in the, in the valley here. And um, a nearly 70 mile branch was built from Shoshone and Haley that was completed in May of uh, 1883. And um, the branch connected the, the valley to the outside world, brought in large amounts of investment capital and caused a major economic boom. And Strayhorn uh, played a, a large part in that. Uh, one of the things Strayhorn did was made a fortune by trading on inside information as it be known now. He and some other insiders formed in 1881, the Idaho and Oregon Land Improvement Company. They knew where the, uh, the tracks would go before they were built. They knew where the, the stops would be before the line was built. Uh, so he and uh, Kansas Sen uh, Senator Caldwell and Andrew Mellon, who was later Secretary of the Treasury and some others formed this company to acquire worthless desert land um, where the depot would be built, uh, plant it, subdivide it, uh, bring in water and irrigation systems and sell it at uh, huge profits once the railroad arrived. And they developed a series of uh, new towns, including Mountain Home, Caldwell, Weezer, Ontario, Oregon, and also owned towns of Shoshone and Haley. Um, as Strayhorn knew the Union Pacific was going to build a route into the Wood River Valley, he, he had his company by the town site of Shoshone and also the town site of Haley and the Croy Ranch and the Quigley Ranch, so they had substantial property there. Haley was intended to be the terminus of the Wood River Branch, and Strayhorn intended to make it into the Valley's Industrial Center, or what he called the Denver of Idaho. And they strongly opposed the eventual extension of the, of the railroad to Ketchum, since it would erode uh, uh, Haley's economic power. However, the Philadelphia smelter was located north of Ketchum at the head of the Wood River Valley. And that was a source of most of the traffic of uh, things coming in and going out of the, of the valley. So they prevailed on a railroad to extend the, the, the Wood River branch to um, directly to its site, which was a mile north of Ketchum at that time. And that was uh, completed in July of 1884. This happens to be just a, a newspaper publication or ad showing that uh, the railroad was completed to Haley. And from Haley, you could take it to Shoshone and go east, west, north or south. And the valley was connected to the world. This is the map of uh, this is the Oregon short line from Ranger, Wyoming, through Pocatello, Wood River Branch, all the way to Portland. And this is the main UP branch or uh, tracks uh, starting in Omaha and going down to uh, Sacramento. So water was critical, it was a critical resource and critical to everything that went on in the valley, whether it was mining, uh, industrial use, or uh, irrigation. Uh, Idaho law recommended or uh, recognized three what are called beneficial uses of water, municipal or domestic use, agriculture and industrial use. And towns needed water for domestic use, firefighting, irrigation, 
farmers needed a large amount for irrigation, typically um, provided by canals, taking water from the uh, rivers and streams. And industrial uses covered everything from mining to smelting, electricity, sawmills, and ice, ice ponds, which I find interesting. The Desert Land Act of 19, 1877 said any ci citizen could claim 64, 640 acres of federal land in the arid west and would get title to it once sufficient water was provided to it within three years. And that was one of the number of federal laws that encouraged settlement of the west. Uh, irrigation systems and water systems were very expensive to build and investment companies like the Oregon, the Idaho and Oregon Land Improvement Company were necessary to provide the amount of capital. And indeed, Strayhorn uh, had $500,000 of investment capital to uh, fund his many activities. And lots of land in the West, lots of towns in the West were uh, the result of uh, those rights under the, under the uh, Desert Land Act. Uh, including uh, Haley. Now, um, Idaho law, uh, water law, uh, fact water law in the West is a little different than from the East. In the East, uh, most water law is based on what is called riparian rights, where every property owner adjacent to a, a water source has equal rights to the water uh, based on the amount of uh, land that they have. That was the common law system in, in England. However, throughout the West, uh, we're, our predecessors were more independent and they adopted a first come first serve basis where the first person to claim water rights had priority over everyone else who came later. And in 1881, Strayhorn um, described uh, Idaho law in the following, uh, irrigators to, take, to get a, a water right had to post notice of the intended water division at the point of diversion or POD, state the amount of water claimed, the purpose and place of its use and how it would be diverted and then record it uh, at the county seat, which in those days was 85 miles away in a Rocky Bar. So it took quite a trip to actually record your, your water claim. And priority in time securing priority of right known as the doctor doctrine of prior appropriation uh, was adopted as uh, part of the water law in Idaho. And Idaho law, territorial law, uh, required a beneficial use of the water. Uh, work had on the canal had to begin within 60 days of posting and uh, Idaho law gave canal owners the right to go through other people's property to either build or later um, maintain uh, the canals and water rights, water rights would be lost if they weren't used. Uh, in Idaho's 1889 constitution stated the water and rivers and streams belong to the state, but recognized the right of citizens to appropriate water for beneficial uses by making an application for a water appropriation to the state engineer whose, water, whose office was created in 1895 and pre-1889 water rights were to be defined through the courts. And in 1965, the constitution was changed and a predecessor to the Idaho Department of Water Resources was established to uh, uh, perform water planning. And since 1971, to establish new water rights, an application had to be filed with the uh, IDWR and uh, doesn't become real property until a license is issued. And importantly, in 1978, the legislature declared that minimum stream flow flows are beneficial use for the purpose of preserving streams. That meant if a farmer was not using all the uh, water he had the right to, if he didn't use it, he might lose it under the old law, but if he contributed back to the, the stream to maintain the, uh, uh, the water flow that was seen as a beneficial use. Um, this is just uh, uh, from the, the uh, Idaho Department of Water Resources uh, site, uh, website, and it, uh, if someone wants to read it later, 
it tells exactly what and how the uh, department exercises its legal functions. Now, and if, if any of you are old enough and were around in 1970s when the environmental legislation um, uh, started sweeping the country, uh, there is a writer called Garrett Hardin and he wrote a very influential essay um, that was called, uh, that really discussed the concept of over-exploitation of common resources. His thesis was that if no one had a right to a part of the resource and everyone was uh, trying to use for their own means a common resource, everyone would claim as much as, as they possibly could, irrespective of the impact on the resource. And that's basically what happened to water in all over the arid west, including Idaho. Once you registered a water right, um, there was no state regulation initially about how much water a person could claim. They could put down any number and it would be, it would be accorded that water right. There's no process to see where, whether the, the amount they claimed was actually used. And many of the water rights claimed were wildly excessive in what was either need or used and was never fully utilized. And that led to claims well in excess of the capacity of the rivers to supply them. And the prior appropriation doctrine meant the first claimers had uh, priority over later claimants, even though they couldn't possibly use everything that they claimed. Uh, and this, of course, led to many disputes and lawsuits where courts had to intervene. And um, uh, Idaho saw a whole series of them. I just mentioned a few of them here, and these are some of the major cases. There were many, many other uh, less important cases uh, involving just a few water rights or some smaller resources. But again, the first water case was decided in 1884, just four years after the first water right was claimed. And the city of Bellevue versus Gobel determined the city of Bellevue's uh, water rights in Siemens Creek. 1895 case determined uh, all the water rights in the Littlewood River. The 1906 Stewart case provided in the time of shortage that all water divisions are reduced beginning with the newest and ending with the earliest. So all irrigators share the, the shortage. And really the seminal uh, case was the Frost case in 1909 that determined all the water rights in the Milan River system, including the Big, big and Water uh, Little Wood Rivers. And um, the findings of the, of the Frost uh, Court really determined water rights for the, uh, most of the 20th century. And then most recently, even a bigger uh, legal adjudication was the Snake River Pact that determined water rights for the entire uh, Snake River system. And I'll just quickly take you through uh, the history of the Wood River Valley and show you the kinds of appropriations that were made for the different uses. First is uh, municipal use for water. Bellevue's water rights uh, were claimed in uh, March of 1880 uh, when its founders uh, claimed 300 inches of water from Siemens Creek and Muldoon Canyon. Um, this is uh, obviously a modern map. Uh, this is the Muldoon Canyon Road and here's Siemens Creek, named for one of the early settlers. And a ditch brought the water from the creek into the, um, the town and distributed to various places. And there was a, a public well in the middle of the, of the main street. And this is a little blurry, this is a historic picture of Bellevue. And that little thing there that you can probably barely see is the main water well. This is where people came with their buckets to the middle of Main Street to get water to take back to their, their houses. Um, disputes over other people claiming water or taking water from uh, Siemens Creek led to litigation in 1884 where Bellevue was given the right to 300 inches of, uh, of water and all the other uh, potential users were ordered to respect that, although that number was uh, reduced to 150 inches later. 
And it turned out that this primitive water system wasn't sufficient for the town. So they turned to private capital to uh, get a better system. And in 1887, Bellevue issued a franchise to, the Bell to several Bellevue businessmen, including my great grandfather and his best friend, Henry Miller, who owned the Minimore Mine. And they formed the Bellevue Water Company build a new water system using wooden pipes to bring water in from springs near what is the present Idaho Ranch to replace the open ditches. And they removed the, the well from Wall Street, or from Main Street. Um, that didn't uh, resolve all the issues. Uh, there's another uh, piece of litigation over the uh, water rights in Seaman Creek above the 150 inches that uh, Bellevue had and there were problems with the Bellevue Water Company um, that resulted in a number of lawsuits. Uh, Bellevue actually sued the water company in 1891 for providing insufficient water for fire protection. And there was a series of fires in Bellevue that led to further problems. So it led in 1908 the, the city to purchase the water company for $4,800, but they didn't invest in it for a long period of time. And then two additional fires show the need for substantial public investment. In 1909, there was a fire that almost burned down the town of, of Bellevue, burned down my great grandfather's international hotel, Neil Campbell's blacksmith shop and a number of other buildings. In 1912, there was another major fire that caused problems. And as reported in the newspaper, two men were burned to a crisp. Uh, this resulted in um, delayed improvements made between 1920 and 1925 after voters approved a, a um, bond issue uh, that rebuilt the water system, financed new access to the springs in Muldoon Canyon, a new pipe was installed, settling tanks were built, and finally in uh, 1939, a WPA grant was used to replace the old wooden pipes with steel ones. And this is a, the ponds out in Muldoon Canyon um, where the water comes from. Just two weeks ago, um, we know that problems uh, are, are uh, continuing, that one of the old uh, pipes put in 1939 uh, needs to replace at a cost of $426,000. So that's something that Bellevue has to deal with. Moving up, uh, to the north, to Haley, uh, John Haley filed a claim to 440 acres in 1880 under the Desert Land Act of 1877. And in April 81, 1881, uh, 500 inches of water were claimed from Indian Creek, which is just north of town for uh, Haley's water supply. And here's again a modern uh, map. This is Indian Creek and uh, it comes down here. Uh, Haley also had a uh, Main Street uh, well that's located uh, near where Sawtooth Motors is, is located now. And um, I already mentioned that in 1882, Robert Strayhorn's company purchased the town and a lot of surrounding land, uh, intending to make it the, the metropolis of the Wood River Valley. Um, in 1883, the company built a major ditch called the Big Ditch, taking a substantial amount of water from the Big Wood to supply to Haley and areas to the south that the, uh, the company owned. And Indian Creek now is still a major part of uh, Haley's water supply, although it's supplemented by uh, well water and a uh, number of other uh, sources. Uh, this talks about the uh, the Big Ditch and the Idaho and Oregon Development Company claiming 12,000 inches of water from the Big Wood. And it was diverted from the, the river four and a half miles north of town and it brought water to Haley and the six other Desert Land Claims Act that the, uh, the company owns south. Uh, they formed uh, their own irrigation company uh, and they built, they dug the big ditch in, 18, in 1883, and they formed another company uh, to sell water to uh, Haley residents. Um, this was a major canal 
Um, it was point of diversion number 22, just south of the Starwater subdivision and ran through Haley on its east side to irrigate land to the south. Ditch was 14 feet wide at the top, 10 feet wide at the bottom and three feet deep. And the Frost decision in 1909 found the canal only diverted 6,000 inches of water, not the 12,000 they claimed, and they reduced the water rights accordingly. Uh, this shows the route of the big ditch or what's now the Hiawatha Canal going from about Ohio Gulch, uh, east of uh, Haley and coming down, um, you know, south of Haley beyond the airport. Get some water rights um, started about the same time. H.C. Uh, Lewis was one of the original pioneers. Uh, he made a claim in April of 81 uh, to irrigate his ranch for, uh, using water from uh, Trail Creek. Uh, his ranch later became Brass Ranch that the uh, Sun Valley Company acquired for Sun Valley. And that uh, first water right now irrigates the Sun Valley Golf Course, still in use. Uh, in uh, uh, Shortly thereafter, in 1883, Lewis uh, claimed 200 inches of Trail Creek water for the town water supply. And that became Port uh, Diversion 2. Um, shortly, the, the company turned to private capital again. Uh, Lewis and others formed the Ketchum Water Supply Company. And they were the ones that provided water uh, from those sources uh, to the, the city of Ketchum. Um, here you can see one of the original uh, wooden pipes and the original well house is located just across uh, the road from uh, what is now Sun Valley Lake, uh, very near the, the uh, community uh, school. Uh, so that was municipal uh, uses. There was also huge amounts of water taken for agriculture and industrial uses. Um, Between, uh, again, we're in Water District 37, and between Ketchum and the Magic Reservoir, there are 75 points of diversion for canals or ditches taking water from the Big Wood. From Magic Reservoir to the Snake River, there are 43 points of uh, departure. And in the Littlewood River, from Silver Creek to Gooding, there are 96 points of de departure. And there are at least five PODs on the Lad River between Gooding and the Snake River. So those are an awful lot of uh, points where water is taken from our valuable resources. And some are for huge canals like the, the big ditch and others are for small ditches that just irrigate single farms. And in the Wood River Valley, the PODs are numbered sequentially from the north with Lewis's being number one and two. These maps will give you a sense of what the overall big picture looks like. These are from Nature Conservancy and uh, the state. And on the left, there's Ketchum, Haley, and uh, Bellevue down here. Here's the Bellevue Triangle. And these are just a, a series of the uh, canals that irrigate land in the Bigwood River. Um, a number of them are in the, uh, the Bellevue Triangle area, which historically have been, uh, was the most productive farmland and produced most of the food for Big Wood Valley in the Civil Rush days. One of the things that I found very interesting to learn from Jim Bartolino is that during the last ice age, uh, this whole area was covered in ice. And as the ice melted, there's an ice dam that uh, formed down here that blocked um, the, the melting water and a large lake formed here. And uh, so all of the uh, flow from the big wood ended up in this lake. It brought rocks and sand, and that really um, contributed to the geologic uh, basis of, of the triangle now, where east of the river, or excuse me, west of the river, it's uh, basically rock and very porous. So the river or the water pours right through to the aquifer and to the east where the farmland was, it's uh, very rich soils. This again shows the big picture of what it looks like. This is the Big Wood River, Bellevue Triangle with, with its complex of uh, 
uh, of canals. Here's the Littlewood River and showing the complex of canals down uh, as we get to Shoshone and Richfield. I've gone through and shown all of the points of diversion uh, around uh, uh, Ketchum. And these are water district maps and all the numbers are into individual ports of diversion. One and two were, the, were uh, Lewis. Uh, this is the Big Wood coming here. This is Trail Creek, here's Warm Springs. And there are a number of uh, points of diversion in, uh, in Warm Springs. Uh, the Philadelphia smelter had extensive water rights. It was located at the head of the Wood River, uh, excuse me, the Warren Springs Canyon on the west side of the highway. They ultimately owned 400 acres here and 1,000 acres west of the, of the uh, road. Uh, it was built at, for $500 million in 1881, and it smelted most of the ore, not only in the valley, but the surrounding mining districts. Uh, it had uh, 2,000 inches of water rights from Warren Springs Creek to operate its machinery. And it uh, dug a ditch from near where Dyer Hot Springs was to bring water down to the smelter. That's the smelter site. The railroad, when it was built in 1884, didn't stop at Ketchum. It was a mile south, but it came directly into the smelter site itself. Uh, this, that little... Uh, building you can see there was stacked full of silver uh, ore uh, bars waiting for transport out. And this is a large flume that was built in 1887 to bring its water down to the site to operate its machinery. These are just some diversion you can see now that probably were what was used by the smelter to bring water out. They're used for Sun Valley um, snowmaking now. Another industrial use was Geyer Hot Springs, which was located just west of the uh, Warren Springs ski area. Uh, Geyer and Lewis uh, got both land and water rights there, and they decided to build a resort, which was well known for the water's medicinal capabilities and became a very fashionable place to go. Uh, Lewis obtained 200 inches of water rights from Warren Springs Creek and um, this is the picture of what it looked like in 1884. And again, the Warren Springs ski area is just right down here. Uh, a new hotel was built there in 1914. Uh, that again, was a huge tourist site. In 1929, its owner decided it was too far away. He uh, built an, a pipe to take its water underground into Ketchum to the uh, Bald Mountain Hot Springs. Uh, that he built. It's now the uh, Limelight Hotel. Um, this is what the new hotel looked like in 1914. They had a huge outdoor swimming area. There's the pipe bringing the water from the springs over and it runs under Warren Springs Road and it still heats a number of houses along Warren Springs. There's the old Bald Mountain Lodge and here's their swimming pool. Um, water for farm use uh, was fairly extensive. This is for the uh, Farnham Ranch that was just beyond the smelter site. Here's Ketchum. This is the uh, Warren Springs Road. And this, this is what some of the diversion points look like now. Comstock Ditch is the biggest one in, in the north part of the valley. Its point of departure is across from St. Luke's and it goes all the way down and puts water into uh, Greenhorn Gulch that was a, a ranch at that point. And again, this is, shows you the number of points of departures as we go south. There's Haley, there's Bellevue, lots of points of departure here, lots down here, and lots of springs down here in the, in the triangle, making it uh, highly productive farmland. Um, some of the industrial uses, the one I love is ice production. Uh, recognized by the, the, uh, uh, the 1909 decision. And Mr. Purdy, who, who uh, had property south of Haley, uh, had the right to get enough water to make 2,000 tons of, of ice. And that's what the uh, ice making uh, operation looked like. Generation of electricity was another recognized uh, industrial use. 
and the Idaho Electric Supply Company in 1889 claimed 14,000 inches of Bigwood water to uh, generate electricity for Haley. And they put in a very sophisticated um, uh, generating plant designed by the Edison Company in New York. Other industrial uses included milling and power generation again. Um, uh, Orrin Rockwell owned a number of mines in Galena Gulch, west of uh, Bellevue. He owned through Idaho Consol uh, Consolidated Mines. In 19, uh, 100, uh, 1907, he built a large mill to mill the ore uh, from Galena Gulch and um, had uh, it at the cost of a quarter million dollars. And um, he got, he claimed 50 inches of water to, uh, for that. And he also built a power mill, a power company, he had a power company. And he took uh, water from the big wood to generate electricity to power the mill and to power uh, uh, the, the city as well. These, I'll just rush through. This is, these are two north south uh, maps if you want to see them. There's one. The red uh, canal took the power, or took the water to the mill, which is right about here. The green took the water to his power generation plant that was right there. Um, there are a number of other uh, ditches. Uh, the Siemens ditch, which is south of, you know, south of Haley, uh, went down to, to Bellevue. We're going to talk about the big ditch. A few others that were important. Uh, the Witten Ditch in 1884 was quite large, 2,000 water inches of water claimed, and it took water again from Mid Valley down to uh, Bellevue and South. One of the bigger canals was dug by the Brown Brothers in 1884. They owned land south of Bellevue. They took 10,000 inches of uh, water out um, just south of Haley and took it through the city of Bellevue and uh, south to irrigate their land. Um, this is the Brown Brothers Canal that um, starts just about the uh, west of the airport and goes all the way down. Here's the town of Bellevue and it goes south. So these were extensive, very extensive works. And many of these canals went through the city of Bellevue and they're open canals, some of them 10 or 15 feet wide. And the city was always after the canal owners to maintain them because people had to have little bridges to get from the street into their, uh, uh, their, their homes. Uh, another very large canal uh, that uh, started at Bellevue was built between 1884 and 1991. Uh, it was initially known as the Kingsbury and Madison Canal that was acquired later in 1908, where another company um, built a dam that still exists in the in the uh, uh, just west of Bellevue, and they diverted 23,000 inches of snow of water for a new town they are planning south of Bellevue. Um, that's now known as the division diversion 45 for the point of diversion, um, and it takes water from west of Bellevue down south into the triangle and then forms a spider web of, uh, of uh, you know, mini canals. And this will just give you a little sense of what it is. Starts here west of Bellevue, goes here, and this is what it looks like as it gets into the, the triangle, keeps going further and ends up at Gannett. But you can see how many uh, different uh, places there are that it takes water. This is what the dam looks like just west of, of Bellevue. This is looking west and this is looking downstream. Um, and this is the main canal going by the, the Howard Reserve. This is where it goes under Highway 75 just south of Bellevue. And this is taking it uh, further east. Uh, and this is the same canal as it further, goes further on. Um, this happens to be Neil Campbell's uh, farm just uh, east of Bellevue, and it shows how well watered some of those areas were. It's in the yellow here. Started by the Idaho Ranch, went up Lookout Mountain and down Gannett Road. 
and he had water from uh, through the Campbell Ditch from uh, Siemens Creek. He had water from the Whitten Ditch, and he also had water from the uh, the uh, Brown Brothers Canal. This just is a list of some of the major canals south of Bellevue, and there were a bunch. The best known are the Glendale Canal and the Bypass Canal that basically divert all the water south of Bellevue, either east of the water, uh, east of the river or, or west of the river. So the river uh, is, is dry for um, the latter part of the summer. You can see again, this is the, what's known as the bypass, it takes water from the river to east of it. And there are a whole bunch of other canals that come from that. There are seven other points of departure once the, the water leaves the river. Um, this is this shows how it goes down south to ultimately um, Sun Valley Ranch and then goes to various places again all to the east of the river. And it, it takes all the water away. This is what it, uh, it looks like in July. Uh, that's the big wood and that's the, the ditch and it shows you why the downstream users are complaining because nothing is going south for them while all this water is taken uh, to, to use to the north. And again, these are more maps and uh, um, canal routes. Um, let's take a, quick, take a quick look at um, water issues outside the Wood River Valley. This is all south of the Wood River Valley rights uh, acknowledged and recognized by the Frost case. 1882, domestic water for, Sh for Shoshone, 60 inches. 1884, the Big Wood River Canal and Reservoir Company took 160 inches of water out. Uh, 1891, the Mullins Canal and Reservoir Company claimed 750 inches. 1893, Littlewood Canal took water from the Little Wood uh, into the uh, surrounding areas. And in 1899, the Big Cottonwood Canal Company took uh, water from the Big Wood and transferred it to the Little Wood area uh, to irrigate uh, ranches around there. And my great grandfather uh, was part of that and it ir irrigated part of his land. And 1903, Shoshone claimed 3,000 inches of Littlewood water to generate power. These just show you again the series of canals that exist South Valley. Here's the Big Wood River here. There's Magic Reservoir. Here's a Richfield Canal. And here's how it has actually four sub canals that irrigate this whole area around Richfield, Dietrich, and Shoshone and, and uh, Gooding. This is called the Lincoln Bypass that takes more water around Gooding. And this is the Milner Gooding Canal that we mentioned before that takes water from the Snake up to the Shoshone area. This, this shows uh, the same area. And this is, this is desert and that's irrigated land. Before this land was irrigated, everything looked like that. And this is just a great Uh, let me Turn just, I video. talked about diversions around uh, uh, Shoshone. Uh, the last part is, uh, I was going to talk about the Frost decision of 1909. Mm -hmm. And that was so, a simple... So, John, we cannot see your screen. Okay. All we see is a, a blank tile um, that shows that there's no video capability. Right. I don't have any, I didn't bring the PowerPoint up. Oh, okay. Uh, obviously, I'm continuing to have some problems with my computer. Okay. So let me just talk a little bit about the Frost decision and that's sure. really, um, about the, the last thing. Um, by the late 1800s, early 1900s, we had exactly the same problem as uh, is seen now. The uh, upstream users around the Wood River Valley with junior water rights were taking too much water out and the downstream users around Shoshone weren't getting what they were legally entitled to. 
1905, they filed a uh, major lawsuit where all the downstream users uh, sued the upstream users. And in 1907, a special master was appointed and they took testimony uh, from many, many people, hundreds of people. And they looked at every claimed water right that had been made in the Big Wood and, and Little Wood River basins. Uh, it took basically three or four years to go through that. It's fascinating. Those files are available at the community library. Um, a law firm, a Haley law firm involved, Ensign and Ensign, donated those files. And they actually have depositions of people talking about their claimed water rights. So they went through every water right in both, both basins all the way down to the Malad. And in, 19, in October 1909, issued a, an opinion that was filed both in Lincoln County in Shoshone and Blaine County in, uh, uh, in Haley. And for every water right, uh, they looked at the amount claimed and the amount actually used. And in a number of instances, they found the claim amount was never used. For example, Strayhorn's company claimed the right to 10,000 inches, but the court found they only took out and used 6,000 inches. So that water right in 1909 was reduced. And if you look at copies of the findings of fact and conclusions of law and the decree, every single person with a right, water right is listed. It gives the amount of water, the source, where it was intended use. And then um, in the, um, the decree, it has the legal description of the, uh, of the uh, property itself. And both my Campbell relatives and my fall relatives were involved in that and had their water rights determined. And um, it, it uh, you know, it uh, determined water rights for large water companies, power companies, uh, everyone who took water out of the system. So it was this huge seminal case and that really determined how water was used throughout the 20th century. Um, what happened, the next step was the Snake River adjudication. And that was a process started in um, 1987 as a result of litigation between the state and Idaho Power over the amount of water that was guaranteed for power generation. And it ended up looking at every single water right in the whole Snake River system which I think it's the decree said it was 83% of, of Idaho and an extensive, uh, huge area, many, many rivers, many, many tributaries. And it took, um, I believe 24 years and $94 million. And all those water rights were ultimately determined in its uh, final decision in, in 2014. And the decision is 275,000 pages. Uh, that shows how comp complex it is. So that's really um, the Frost decision on steroids, and that will guide water rights claims and use forward um, for the next 100 years, presumably. So that's really the end of my presentation. Uh, the only other thing I would say is that um, I've agreed to do one more talk on water rights sometime in the early fall. It will be the impact of the Reclamation Act of 1902 on Idaho, and that's really what um, made the desert bloom, created all of the Snake River irrigation projects, the Minidoka projects, uh, the uh, Magic Dam, and uh, changed Idaho from a rural state to an agricultural state. So uh, Kristen will, once we've determined the date, she will advertise that. So thank you all for listening. Sorry for my old computer misbehaving. Well, thank you, John. Um, and thank you. I was going to give a plug for a book that we have here at the library. It's called A Little Dam Problem um, by attorney Jim Jones, who was the attorney general in Idaho for the court case that John mentioned that started in um, 1987. Uh, he was a Republican attorney general, general and he partnered with a Democratic governor to uh, fight Idaho Power for that um, uh, decision that John was just mentioning that resulted in um, 
adjudication of all the Snake River water rights. John, I have a question for you. Um, uh, uh, so, so the the adjudication that happened in 1987 was for the whole Snake River, but the Wood River flows into the Snake River, and mm -hmm. so I'm I was I've been puzzled why why our water wasn't adjudicated at that same time and why that's only coming to pass now. Do, do you know why that, why, why that came to be? Well, the Wood River was in fact adjudicated, the Big and Wood. Oh. But keep in mind, uh, historically, um, surface water from the rivers and streams has been one system and well water has been another and they've never been regulated together. So um, really the, the Snake River adjudication dealt with surface water. Uh, I don't think it got into the issues of groundwater. And that was what it was different about this June decision. For the first time, uh, a court said those have to be considered together, which is correct from the standpoint of hydrology and geology. But it's just a matter of the regulatory system catching up with the geologic um, reality. Hmm. Yeah, and our but, understanding of how that all works yeah, together. The Big Wood was one of the last river systems to be adjudicated, but that, that in fact was done. Hmm. You know, every okay. single water system in the Snake River Basin was adjudicated. Hmm. Well, a fascinating history. And, and uh, one of the things I love about your presentations is you have in written form so many more details than you're, you're ever able to... Um, uh, speak about so people can go back to this talk, hit pause, and then read through the details um, of some of these canals and diversions and cases that you've mentioned tonight. So, well, um, Kristen, I should I should also mention that when I prepared this in 2017, I did a paper that's about 100 pages. That uh, what I did tonight just really just skims the surface. Uh, mm -hmm. That paper is available at the community library if you want to really get into detail. And if anyone wants to contact me, I'd be happy to send them an uh, electronic version if uh, they have, if their eyes haven't blurred tonight <laughs> by uh, seeing all this stuff. Well, and um, when I send an email out to everyone who signed up for this talk, I'll mention that as well. So um, direct them to the community library, the um, historical regional history uh, department for that information. So thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you, John. Look forward to our um, next talk. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your patience while we work through these um, inevitable technological glitches. And um, please have a, a lovely evening. Stay cool. And uh, hope the smoke, smoke's not bothering you too much. So good night, everybody.